welcome to what is actually the second event of the Book Trust this year, um, Sheelings of Park, and I'll do my plug, sales plug, right at the start, but there are copies of my book on which this talk is based over there, and they're available today after the talk for the fantastically reduced price of £10. <laughs> it's, it's usually 11 so uh, a wonderful opportunity. So um, I'm going to give a talk for, I don't know, but half an hour or so, uh, so I hope you can stay along and <laughs> awake for that time. And there will be an opportunity for some questions, discussion afterwards, but by 12 o'clock is my plan. We, we will be leaving to go to see some of the shielings. And the other thing to say right at the start is that, in view of the numbers, um, I'm planning that we can get there by private cars. So I hope that's, those that are coming, I hope everyone's coming. Um, I have three seats at least, possibly four spare seats in my car. Ben here has a few. Oh, no, no, Jan, so Jan, Jan at the back does, Les has. So we'll sort, we'll sort it out nearer, nearer 12 o'clock when we leave, but we, I hope we can all get there um, you know, by private car. We're not driving a long distance, so um, I hope that's acceptable to everyone. So the Sheelings of Park. And let me just... Now let me start off by the obvious question, <laughs> what are shielings? Now this first slide, if you can read it, gives a very, what I would call, economics-based description of the functions of shielings. And um, that isn't the only function, and I'll come <laughs> to some of the other things that happened at the shielings <laughs> later on. But I think we start off by this sort of economics-based functional analysis of what shieldings are. The first thing to mention, as you see in the very first point there, is that there is some confusion as to whether shieldings are bits of land or the buildings that are there. It's a bit like crofts. I think a lot of people from the outside don't distinguish between a croft, which is actually a piece of land, and the house that is often built on the croft, which you know, is usually called a croft house. But there are people from the outside who refer to the houses as crofts. That's not actually technically correct. And you have the same issue over shielings. I think more people, in fact, when they think of what is a shieling, they think of the structure that's built on the shielings. But actually, shielings means a piece of land, and it's used, it's land on which livestock are grazed during the summer months. And this is a very common feature throughout at least Europe. It's just that it's, it's hung on later in Lewis than in many other areas, particularly on the mainland. And it tends to be in upland areas where the quality of the soil, I suppose, and the exposure and the climate uh, makes agriculture a fairly marginal activity, as crofters amongst us will recognize, so that every bit of grazing pasture available needs to be used. And up on in the uplands, or in our case on the moors, there is additional grazing, but only during the summer months. So this is what is what the ethnologists, I think, called, called transhumance, the movement of livestock on a seasonal basis to take advantage of the extra grazing that there is for just a few weeks sometimes um, on the uplands. And that coincides with when the crops are being grown on the inby land and you need anyway to get the livestock out of that in by land while the crops are being grown. So there's a logic to it. And it's still practiced, I think, in places like Switzerland and in Scandinavian countries. The 
their shielings tend to be up the mountains, if you like. Ours tend to be on the moorland, but on what is now the common grazings. Um, so livestock grazing there and associated buildings. The, the actual practice of shielings, and I, what I'm describing is really what has been the practice and the economic function for a couple of hundred years in the case of Park up until the very early 20th century. So from about 1700 or so up to about 1900 or so, those 200 years, this was a period of growing population in Park and in Lewis as a whole. So the pressure of, the pressure of people and uh, livestock on the land was increasing all the time. So it made it even more important during those years that there was extra grazing available on the moor. So this seasonal practice um, traditionally uh, it didn't, it, it, the, the world, the, almost certainly was the use of shielings well before 1700, but, I'm, but from 1700 it became particularly important for economic reasons to go to the shielings. And there was a, a regular seasonal element to this. Um, and traditionally, even before 1700, in fact, well before 1700, the, the date for moving to the Sheelings was on the 1st of May, Beltane, which was the most important Celtic day of the year, start of summer, 1st of May. And that was the case way back even to in pre-Christian times, Beltane being a pre-Christian festival. Now, in the 16th century, the old calendar was changed to the Gregorian calendar and 10 days were missed out. So what used to be the 1st of May, Beltane, became the 11th or so of May. So in, during the period I'm talking about, 1700 to 1900, it was about the 11th of May that it was traditional for people to go to the Sheelings. And it's you know, no, actually no coincidence that we are almost on the, the day of going to the Sheelings, as, you know, on the 13th of May. And interestingly, and there are croft, people have been crofters for much longer than I am here, so uh, maybe we can discuss this later, but even in places like Lemreway, um, I am told by local people that the 11th of May was actually the date at which people put their sheep out onto the common grazings. And they sh sort of shouldn't be on the inland. It was customary anyway not to have the livestock on the in by land after the 11th of May until round about uh, early August when the harvest was collected and the, the animals could come back again. So this long established tradition goes right back to pre-Christian times, Beltane. I think it's, you, know, you can still see echoes of it today. It's, you know, today it's a lot of livestock are kept in the in by land um, right through the summer. But traditionally until even within living memory, they had to go out to the, to the common grazings um, round about the 11th of May. And I think that is a, a direct uh, descendant, if you like, of the old Beltane custom. And there was a very clear gender demarcation in the roles of men and women when, in terms of the, going to the shielings. Typically, the men would go out <coughs> before the 1st of May to check that the structures on the shielings, which are more correctly known in Gaelic as bohan, B-O-T-H-A-N, um, the men would go out <coughs> to check that the bohan were in good order, usually putting a, making sure the roof was intact or putting a new roof on it even. Then on the 1st of May or later the 11th of May, the whole community, <laughs> men, women and children and livestock, not just 
cattle. Uh, cattle was the sort of the main livestock when this tradition started, particularly milk, dairy cattle, but also sheep and horses and goats and uh, the whole kebang of them, shebang of them, would go out with people and to the shealings and the women and children would often stay at the shealings for several weeks. The men would go back and in the case of Park, particularly during the period I'm concentrating on, fishing was a major occupation. So during the summer months when the women, or it couldn't have been all of the women, but some of the women and some of the children were at the shealings, a lot of the men were out fishing. So it, this all fitted into a, uh, you know, a cycle of seasonal activity. Um, and while they were at the shealing, the women would milk the cows, make, make um, cheese and butter, and people from the townships would come out to collect the butter and milk and cheese periodically. So there was you know, continuous communication between the township and the people out of the shealings. But the people that stayed out of the shealings tended to be the women and sometimes the children. Which brings me on to the other, well, I'll, I'll, it does bring me on to the other traditions associated with the shealings, because, because it was the women and often the young women who were left out at the shealings. <laughs> um, uh, it was the shealings became a place where the young men and women of the area could meet each other. And uh, out of, in, in many times, out of the, the sort of social restrictions that there were in the townships. And this is a very important part of the social traditions of the Sheelings. So this economics-based thing it tells only part of the story. And I'll say a bit more about this uh, later on. So the, that's the key economic functions, I think. That's not to say that some of the shealings or the structures on them didn't serve other purposes at different times. Some of the shealings, I've no doubt, went back way back into history or prehistory. There is evidence that shealings were sometimes used to mark the boundaries of particular um, ownership. And some of the shealings were deliberately placed at the, on the boundaries in order to mark the territory of a particular landowner. Um, also, and this, there are some of the shealings of park that fit into this idea. Some of them seem to uh, have very good view. They, they have, the, the sites are, have a wonderful vista. So I suspect that some of them were used as lookout places. There's one place, for example, in the Lemmeraway, on the Lemmeraway Common Grazings, where you can see right up the Minch, almost as far as Cape Wrath, and then down way past Sky. So I think maybe in prehistoric times there was another function for some of these shealings in terms of uh, keeping an eye on possible invasions of, of other people coming to, coming to the island. And and, and thirdly, um, uh, some of the shealings, some of the structures, were possibly used for religious purposes. I'll come on to the design of the shealings, of the, of the bochum, which in the case of Park, in my, as far as I can see, uh, all of them were the beehive structures. I'll show you some pictures in a minute. And th this design is a very, very old design of stone-built buildings with the stones gradually over extending so that eventually you got to a stage where you could fill in the gap at the top of the shielding by putting in a stone which closed the, back, the gap. Now, that's exactly the design that you see in places like Skellig Michael in Ireland where there was a very old monastery, other early religious sites, the Garvelock Islands, for example, in Scotland. Um, so it, it, it's not impossible that some of 
our feelings might at one time have had that religious function. But whatever their original function, I think it's clear that they were reused at different times in history so that in the 200 years that I'm talking about mainly 1700 to 1900, their function was, as I've described, to get the cattle uh, out of the in by land during the few weeks of the summer. Now, certainly doesn't ad adequately capture what going to the Sheelings meant in the life of the people of Lewis or Park. And I want just to read you a short extract from Alexander Carmichael, the Victorian folklore collector, um, mainly in Uist, and he was writing in the 19th century, but he was talking about much earlier times based on the folklore and traditions that people mainly in Uist, but also parts of Lewis, were telling him. So this is what he had to say. Carmichael tells us, on the first day of May, which I say in our terms could be the 11th of May, on the first day of May, the people of the Crofter townland are up betimes and busy as bees about to swarm. This is the day of migrating for Vala Gubine from the townland to the moorland, from the winter homestead to the summer shealings. The summer of their joy is come, the summer of the shealing, the song, the pipe and the dance, when the people ascend the hill to the clustered bothies, overlooking the distant sea from among the fronded ferns and fragrant heather, where neighbour meets neighbour and lover meets lover. Now, that's, a, I think, a pretty romantic account, but there's a truth behind it, I think. The going to the Sheelings was the highlight of the year, um, and not just for economic reasons. A lot of marriages were uh, arranged <laughs> at the Sheeling. Again, because of the boundary, the, some of the Sheelings are at the boundary of what is now the different common grazings of the different townships. It was easy, easier for people to meet people from other townships at the boundary. So I think that was a, a relevant factor as well. Now, I don't want to get too much onto the love-making reference, but um, there are shealings in other parts of the Gaeltach that are known as Ari Nasuri. And Suri means love-making. I'm not aware of any Aris that have that name in Lewis, and maybe that tells its own story, but I've no doubt the same activities occurred in Lewis as occurred elsewhere. But what we do have in Lewis and elsewhere are a number of shealings, including one in Park, which are known in Gaelic as Ari Nahern Aikia, or the One Night Shealings. We have what? <laughs> <laughs> we have one in near Cal on the Calvos common grazings, which has that name. And there's a whole array of these throughout, particularly the Outer Hebrides. And um, each of them have stories associated with them as to why they were only used on one night. <laughs> and the stories always have this uh, a, a sort of scare, a scare story that someone goes there or more than one person goes there and during the night Something, something arrives at the shealing, turns into a monster. There's a supernatural element to all of these stories. The unfortunate people who are there get killed, or are, in many stories they do get killed, and no one ever goes near that shealing again because of the, uh, the story that is associated with that. And um, uh, down in, New in Uist, uh, a guy called Simon Davis, who some of you may have come across, he has, he has speculated that um, these stories associated with shealings, particularly the more remote shealings, have been deliberately fostered by 
<laughs> some of the members of the older members usually of the community to scare off the young people from the what he calls the shenanigans of the shillings. And uh, there are there's a lot of these in Lewis actually, <laughs> and we but we don't have any Ari Nasuri, so you know that that speculation seems to me perfectly plausible. Anyway, that's a long, I'm now going to go much more quickly through the remaining slides, but that's trying to give you some sort of overview of the functions of the shielings. There were many different functions, probably changing from time to time, but it wasn't all about the economics of crofting. It was also this social side of um, meeting other people. Right. So what did the Bochum look like? Now these are two pictures, not on Park, but this one is in North Harris, and that one is on the boundary, significantly I think, between Lewis and Harris, near Kinloch Resort over on the west. And that's what I think the park shielings here looked like in their heyday. Stone structures, like a beehive, meeting at the top, usually covered with turf once the stones had been put in place. Um, but our shielings are just ruins now, and we don't have anything like this. But that one still exists today. And that one, that picture was taken 15 years ago by me, so I think it's, there are examples of the original bochum shaped shielings that are still in existence and I think that's probably what the shielings of Park looked like. Um, there are other designs of bochum in other parts of the island, including sort of rectangular buildings. But it does seem to be in southern Lewis and northern Harris where this traditional beehive type structure is the norm. It could just be that there's so much more stone available here, whereas in other parts of Lewis or Harris um, it's easier to get hold of other materials. But this traditional design, which is characteristic of park, um, is also found in other parts of southern Lewis, like Uig on the west and in North Harris, but not, I think, in many other areas. So that's quite an interesting um, thought. Now, once you start looking for shielings, as I spent two or three years doing in Park, five, five or more years ago, you, you, you have to, you come across the problem of how to distinguish what was a shieling from what were other stone remains which had completely different functions altogether. And I've run quickly through some of these. I mean, there's all sorts of stone circles, kelp, bothies on the shore, uh, places which were permanent residences, which but are now deserted, like Stimroway. So it you know, it is actually quite easy to get, get mixed up between what is a shielding and what, what isn't a shielding. And I don't want to spend too much time on what are not shielings, but that's a prehistoric burial cairn near Torrestai in Park. That's definitely not a shielding, it's a burial cairn. That's um, a picture of part of Stimraway, the deserted village which was lived in up until the early 1940s. And that also is not a shielding. So one has to be careful when identifying what is shielings that not to get them mixed up with other, uh, other buildings with different functions. And so this slide tries to um, go through um, how I try to separate out the different things. Um, a major source of um, evidence was the first Ordnance Survey six inch to the mile maps of Lewis, published in 1854, that surveyed um, from 1849 to 1852, so mid 19th century. And they do show 
a lot of ruins or other buildings marked on the map and with often with Gallic names like here which indicate a shilling. Ari is the most common Gallic uh, word for a shilling but there's also the, what has become in English shadder which derives from the Norse word S-E-T-R, setter, which you get in Shetland a lot. Uh, but in Gaelic, the setter has been transformed into shearder, as in the place name in Ness, S-I-A-D-A-R, shearder, which is then anglicised to shadder. So even places like Kershadder almost certainly <laughs> was a shealing at one time. Possibly in that case of shealing connected with Harbost. So the main farm would have been at Harbost, but people would have gone to the shealing at what is now Kershadda. So the, the names, Giari is another one. Shal is, is an English term, but again we have places like Eshal in Park, which almost certainly was a shealing at one time. So the early maps and the place names given on the maps are a very good indication of what may be a shilling and what may not be. A lot of what I'm saying and speculating about, about the timing and when they were built and when they went out of use, can really only be tested by archaeological research and most of the shilings, I think all of them, uh, none of them have really been uh, looked at in the detail required to you know, carbon testing or, or in order to date the origin and, and possible final use of the shielings. Walking the ground, I did a lot of that and <laughs> after a while you become, uh, trend, you know, you, I, I keep fi finding places that must be shielings <laughs> but I suppose on <laughs> reflection they're just to tumble down stones that have tumbled down the rocks but um, the sort of shielings that were used in the, those 200 years tended to be, sort of obviously, like shelter, places that were sheltered. So usually there's a rocky crag behind them to give shelter from the prevailing wind. And it's good, it's good for them to be south facing, but with um, a rocky protection from other directions. Needs an, a water source fairly close to them. So in a way, you can, start, you can start predicting where the shielings ought to be. And these days, of course, you can tell the shielings by the particularly green colour of the pasture, uh, particularly about now when the, you know, in the summer it's more difficult because the whole moor becomes greener. But in the winter and even now, you can pick out the shielings by the colour of the grass, which comes, of course, from their being used by cattle. And finally, on their local local information, and I did my best to talk to local people in Park. And uh, I'm coming on now to when our shielings in Park went out of use, because there is no living memory of anyone alive, at least that I've come across, <laughs> of actually get, of them going to the shielings. There are a, one or two stories. I'm going to just refer to one of them in a minute, of how someone, um, in fact, Sa Sandra McLaughlin, the late Sandra McLaughlin from One Shield Inish, um, Jim's, I was hoping Jim was going to be here today, but Jim's wife passed away a few years ago. Um, she tells a story, which I mention in the book there, of how her father told her that her grandfather had gone to one of the shielings that we are going to see later today. And that, by deduction about dates of birth and so on, was probably in the early 20th century. And that is the one of the very, well, just about the only um, first-hand recollection, oral history being passed on of going to the shielings. And um, there's nothing beyond the early 20th century. Whereas in other parts of Lewis, the shielding tradition did continue much longer than that. There's certainly evidence, again, in, 
some of that's in my book, in the 1930s of how people went to the Sheelings in other parts of Lewis, including Uig and Tolster. Um, and indeed, to some extent, this, that tradition is still going on today, that people in you know, the, both, the bothies along the Pentland Road or the um, up in Ness are um, people no longer take their livestock there, but they people from these townships still go to the, their hut in, on the moorland, spend a few weeks there in the summer, and that is a continuation of the old shielding transhumance tradition. But in Park, all the evidence I could find anyway is that the Park shielings, many of them, in fact most of them, were probably out of use by the 1850s. Not least because the first ordnance survey maps show ruins uh, in the places that have the names with Ari associated with them. So in most of Park, I think they were well, well on the way out by the 1850s and you know, differed from township to township. But I think in most cases, by the 1880s, uh, very few people were going to the Sheelings, if any. And the last evidence at all comes from the stories from Sandra of the early, probably the early 20th century. And if that's correct, one can start to speculate why that was the case. And I have a few speculations in my book, good at speculating. Um, you know, one, one possibility, it seems to me, is that fishing was a very important part of the crofting culture in Park throughout the 19th century. The men tended to be at the fishing to the, in the summer months, uh, more so than in many other parts of Lewis. So maybe that was a reason why the shielings fell out of use earlier in Park than in other parts of Lewis. Although they did, they did continue in Park much longer than most places on the mainland. Now, this is what um, the questions that I've been trying to address in this talk. Um, some of them I've already addressed. Uh, I'm going to go through very quickly where the park shootings were in just a moment. Um, and it, an interesting point, the third, the third bullet point there was, did the, who, did the, who did the shielings and the bochum on them belong to? And there, there is evidence um, that uh, these, these weren't just communal, communal structures. One, once crofting as we know it was introduced in the case of Park early in the 19th century, that's when the old uh, run rig system where land was managed in common was replaced with individual bits of land allocated to individual crofters. So from the early 19th century, the, the crofting townships that we know and individual crofts as we know them started then, certainly from that period onwards, the bochum actually belonged to individual crofts. And um, the main evidence for that is Professor James Caird, who used to bring students to Park in the 1950s and wrote a book which is referenced in my book and collecting from, or, from local people at that time their evidence about the shielings. And he was able, on the basis of local evidence, to uh, link individual shielings on the Kershadda common grazings to individual crofts in Kershadda. And I don't think Kershadda was alone in that respect. Um, so it's, I find that really interesting that, um, you know, a lot of the tradition and the sort of romantic, romanticization that Carmichael and others are perhaps responsible, give the impression that the whole thing was a communal thing. Everyone went out to the Sheelings together, and I think they did. But once they got there, 
they, each family, each croft, crofter and their family would go to their shieling. Now there was obviously a lot of in, you know, communal activity, just there is a, as there was on crofts and people popping into each other's houses and so on. <laughs> That's part of the crofting culture. So that all of that was true. But it does, it does seem that individual structures belonged to, they, I'm not sure they sort of owner, it wasn't owner occupation, but just like a croft, they belonged to a particular crofting tenant and their family. And in other parts of the island, that's where the tradition has survived longer than in Park. That's certainly the case. In North Tolster, the historical society there has published a little booklet which names each of the Bohan and each of the Sheelings and links them to particular people who once used to go to those things. So I think that was the case probably in Park. When were they first used? Well, um, who knows? I don't, I don't know. Some of them could be very early indeed, particularly if they were early Christian structures in some cases. When were they last used? In Park, the 18, well, certainly by the end of the 19th century, the, there was hardly any use remaining. Are there any memories or stories? One or two. I've mentioned those. Let me just quickly flick on though to where, where are the Park shielings? Well, there are over in just in Park itself, Park Estate, there are over 40 locations that I've identified in my book from those various sources that I mentioned. Um, but of course, each of those individual locations typically have several Bohan structures in the area. So if you count up the number of Bohans, it's well over 100 that I think were there at one time in at least 40 different locations. And what I've done in the book is link, is to simply record where these locations are in, in terms of the current 11 crofting townships of Park. So I've allocated them to you know, which common grazings they're currently, they're on now. now and that is an, it's an important caveat that needs to be um, taken into account that move on to, I'll demonstrate this by moving on to the first map. So this is showing, as you can see, from Lemreway, Grava, Orensee, Stimmeraway. The black dots are the different shielings and I've, you know, the, the uh, lettering shows which common grazings that they're, they're on. But many of those shielings were established in pre-crofting days. So even though they're on Lemreway common grazings now. It doesn't mean that in the pre-crofting days uh, they belong to Lemreway, because pre-crofting you had a different ownership structure where the owner of Park, own, yes, the owner of Park, usually the owner of Lewis, would give a, a tack or a lease to a middle man, usually a relative of either the Mackenzies or the Macleods. They would, they would. You know, have have rights over a, quite a large area, and they would then sublet their, their the land that they're least referred to to subtenants. And those previous uh, tax or leases didn't always coincide with the current crofting township boundaries. So, for example, um, I'll show you this. It comes up better on the next slide. Yeah, some of some of the shielings that are down here. This is Glen Graver coming along here and if you go up here there are some shielings up here that are now on the Kershadder common grazings but it's clear from documentary evidence that pre-crofting they belonged to the land, the, the, the tax man, the person who had the lease of the based in either Cremor or uh, Ellen Calanquilia. There were two farms there which had tax covering a much wider area. So some of the crops down here, while I show them on the Kershadda common grazings, which is where they are now, they weren't originally set up to serve the people of Kershadda. They were linked to the uh, people who had the tax in, uh, in the Cremor area. 
Now, just moving on, this is the final map, and this is particularly um, relevant because this includes the shieldings that we are going to see in just a moment. Um, so, this covers the current Crofting Township of Seaforth Head and Shieldenish, which is the SE. Those are all on that common grazings now. This is Eastkin Estate, so not covered by my <laughs> survey. Um, and then over here we've got the Harbost ones and the Care Shadow ones. But it's the what is now on the Seaforth Head and the uh, Shielden, Seaforth Head and Shieldenish common grazings. We are going to have a look at So this is the Eastkin Road here, shown in dotted lines there. That one, SE3, which is known as, marked, indeed marked on maps, as Ari Kulna Krega. It's the shielding behind the rock. That's that one. And then later on, we're going to go to have a look at that one there, SE5, which is below the hill, known as Mullock. Breck Valasque. And my conclusion, and you see, you'll see all the evidence in the book if you want to, is that those were traditionally the shielings of pre crofting settlements that have long been cleared in Shieldenish. And those ruined buildings just there are. The remains of the old village of Shieldenish, which was probably cleared in the 1820s or 1830s, certainly before 1841, because there's no one living there in the 1841 census. So that was one old village that was cleared. And the, the other one was on the other side of the estuary here, the old village of Clayter, which was also cleared in the 1830s. And uh, I, 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 almost certainly, and I, in fact, I think certainly, the, the two shieldings we're going to were used by people from those settlements in pre crofting times. So going back even before 1800, I think, uh, when, when those townships were populated. And we can also deduce how they got to their shielings. And I, I'm going to try and point this out when we go on the road. Kulna Krega tells its own story. It's the back of the rock. So the people from Shieldenish, I think, took their cattle and went out to that those shielings up here, where, the, where there's a very sharp bend on the park road. And you can actually see a sort of valley that goes up here. So I think they went up that way and round the back of the rock to their shielings there. So I think that's the Shieldenish, the old Shieldenish, Shieldenish shieling. And this one is even more clear from place name evidence that this was, these shielings were probably used by probably both Shieldenish and Clayter. And the way that they got to those shieldings was up this broad valley, and we'll have a look at this from, <laughs> from the other side before we go to the shieldings. Uh, there's a river there, which you, I don't know if you can read it, but it says, Alt Bialak Nahimerik. So this valley, the Alt is obviously the river that runs down there, but the valley is known as Bialak, the pass of, Nahimerik, the flitting. And you, you can even see on the ground when you get here, this, if you go up this fairly gradual slope to the pass just there, there's then a steep drop down to where the shielings are and you can trace uh, where the, the route, it's like a footpath, you can see the route of, so I'm pretty sure that that's that's where Sandra McLaughlin's ancestors used to take their cattle 
even possibly into the early years of the 20th century. Um, I need to move it. Right, so this is the first, the first, uh, the first shillings or group of shillings we'll be having a look at just off the Ishkin Road. Um, it's easy to get to. I'll say a few more words before we break up about that. But um, there are several, I think seven from memory, um, different Bohan remains. You can see some of them there. But that's all you can see today of what used to be those structures, the beehive structures in that earlier photograph. So there's about seven of those on clustered together, but probably belonging to individual families from Shieldanish. And then after that, we're going to this one, which is below the hill of Moloch Breck, Valoska, which does have wonderful views. So this is one of the groups of shielings that I think might have had some sort of lookout purpose in old days, because you can see not only right down Loch Skipperclit, but also this is the head of Loch Seaforth there. And you can see part, part of the way down the loch, and there are uh, five, I think, bohans of that, the remains of five bohans like that uh, on that particular location. So we'll be visiting each of those and uh, before we do that, I'm going to, uh, we'll stop on the road. We're actually going to, rather than start off by going straight down the Ishkin Road, we will go a bit along the Park Road to near where the Loch Erisort Hotel is. And we'll just stop the cars there because from there you can see where the old village of Shieldanish was, the old village of Clater was, and you can see the Alak Nahimarek, the pass going up to the Maliska Shielings. So my conclusions, um, most of these I think I've already covered, but uh, with certainly lots of remains still visible. Uh, they're, they're all, in, as far as I can see, uh, these semicircular or circular stone structures of beehive form, typical of southern Lewis and northern Harris, but not elsewhere in Lewis. Most are in a very ruinous state. None of them have roofs anymore. I should have mentioned that inside the structures, um, there were shelves, stone shelves constructed where milk and think and butter and so on was stored. And some of our shielings, you can still see the remains of some of the shelves, including one of the Maliska uh, shielings that we'll see later on. See there, often they are sheltered against a rocky hillside. Both of the ones we'll be going to share that. Many of them command extensive views. That's true of, in fact, both of the ones we're going to, particularly the second one. Um, very difficult to generalize, but some of our shielings are many centuries old, certainly going back to the 18th century to pre-crofting times, but in some cases, probably very much earlier than that. Um, and, but latterly, since crofting was established in the 19th century, they became used by the current crofting townships, but belonged to individual crofts. Um, and we can work out some of the routes taken from those, from where the people live to the shielings, mainly on place name evidence, sometimes by just looking at paths on the ground. Shielings do seem to have gone out of use earlier in Park than in many other areas of Lewis. And there are a few memories left or stories about shielding life. I'll just end though by reading you what Sandra reported from, from this book. Um, so I say, I say that oral history suggests that the Maliska shielings and some of the other shielings in belonging to Shieldanish and Seaforth Head on their, on their common grazings, may have still been in use in the early 20th century by crofters from Shieldanish, in which case they 
may have been among the last to be used in Park. This information is based on the memories of Sandra McLaughlin, who was uh, born as Sandra Smith, whose grandfather, Alexander Smith, born in 1885, told her, and certainly told her father, Sandra's father, that he, Alexander Smith, visited the Sheelings with livestock from Shieldenish in his youth. So, 1885 he was born, and so round about the turn of the century, possibly into the 20th century. The route used to Malaska was through the pass known as Bialakna Himerik, Pass of the Flitting, following the course of the stream Alt Bialakna Himerik, which runs in a broad valley to the south of Shieldenish and Clater, to a pass high above and to the west of the Sheelings below. Sorry, to the west of the Sheelings below Moloch Breck, Balaska. Now this is another story. Sandra's father, Murdo Smith, born in, 18, in 1921, died in 1985, also told Sandra that her grandfather, Alexandra, with others, were out on the moor when, quotes, the moor, the moor went black because of a plague of rats. They took refuge in one of the sheilings, leaving a canvas rucksack and its contents behind on the moor. When they returned the following day, there was nothing left of the rucksack except the metal buck buckles. <clears throat> there is no information on the date of this incident, but it may have been in the early 20th century. So, um, what's that? And so the back, this is the Bialakna Himrik showing the route, which we will see from the, from the road today. So that is the pass up there. And there's a steep drop the other side going down to Loch Skipperclit and Loch Seaforth. And that's where the Sheelings were. But the part, this is the route I think that was taken from Shieldanish and, and possibly Clater before it was cleared to those Sheelings. So, um, probably spoken for longer than, yeah, much longer than I intended. I'll stop now and uh, if there are any questions then we can have a discussion about it and then say we'll set out. But um, it is a propitious day that we're starting out and it's pretty much the right day to visit the Sheelings and uh, I hope we don't encounter any, any rats en route and um, yeah, I hope you all make it there and uh, I'll stop there now. Are there any any questions or points or? Is there any firm evidence of uh, religious use for the any shillings on Lisbeth? Well, I, I'm not aware of any for Park. Mm -hmm. To the west, I think there is, and um, Alistair Macintosh. Uh, his a book that he wrote fairly recently called Poacher's Pilgrimage, where he did a journey all the way up the west side of of Lewis and, and Harris as well. And uh, yeah, he he certainly is of the view that there are a lot of bohans over there which stem from the Christian early Christian period. To the extent, I have to watch one, <laughs> possibly of being. Uh, fixated by early Christian remains. I, pretty, I think it's perfectly plausible that some of them were, particularly on the west side, because there is evidence of a, uh, a sort of pilgrimage route up the west side going up to Ness. But I think over here on the east side of Lewis, um, we do have Ellen, Ellen Halenkelia, so you know it's not impossible there were, there were some monasteries or hermitages linked to that early Christian settlement, uh, we possibly could have used some of our shielings in part, but on the whole, I don't think that that was the typical of the shielings in part. But it's, it's all pretty much a matter of speculation, to be honest. Might be interesting to know that we have complete shielding. Mm. Yeah. 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 Yep, there are a number. Yeah.
Yeah. Coffee visits delicious. I think there's a great opportunity for people over here to reconstruct one of the shielings. <laughs> Is there any other? Um, my point on Grenville is loads of structures mm. which don't look like shielings, but mm. kind of wonder. Yeah, I think. Uh, yeah, I think that. Uh, I'm not sure there's any sort of hard evidence of it, but it, it's you know it, it was natural for people to reuse stone that was available for other purposes. There are sheep fanks out on the moor that constructed from stone and and. And I would say it's almost certain that some of those were used stone from other structures beforehand. And there, there is the one bit of evidence I'm available, I'm aware of, uh, uh, shedding light on what you're saying, although not in park, is that there was in the 19th century a long-running dispute between the owner of Lewis and the owner of Harris as to where the boundary was between <laughs> Lewis and Harris. Um, and it you know it goes across the mountains <laughs> between Lewis and Harris, and it wasn't until the 19th century that the dividing line became important, because deer shooting hadn't really taken off until then as a as an economic activity, and the whole Victorian culture of uh, you know, Balmoral and, and shooting and hunting, so it did become important in the 19th century as to who owned which bits of land and where the deer were and so on. And this legal dispute lasted for nearly 50 years from the first half of the 19th century. And you can see the reports of the court case and there were, you know, the lawyers made a lot of money from this and went on for 50 years. And part of the evidence was that uh, as to where the shielings were. And if the Harris landowner, the Harris landowner was saying, well, you know, I have a shieling there and it used to belong to township in Harris. And the Lewis landlord was arguing to the contrary. And there is some evidence there, reported anyway in the court case, that the landowners you know, not only sort of used maps to show <laughs> where their boundaries were, they encouraged people from there townships to go out and destroy the shielings of the opposing part, part and throw the, throw the stones over the river and yeah. so yeah it is likely I think that that sort of thing happened but I'm not aware of it happening in park. Can I ask you to explain the consumption that you mentioned and I can see that as being the easiest to do. Mm. Would there have been any other style of construction, or is that just the standard? Yeah, well, it, yes, and there's a whole chapter in my book about this. There are different, um, more rectangular structures. Um, a lot of the lot of the structures use other building material, wood, for example, if you could find wood anywhere. Um, and, and I should say some of the, even some of the stone structures were linked together. So you had passageways linking different bochens. Um, but just my observation from seeing the remains on the ground is that they almost all have this circular plan in terms of the foundations. Um, but yeah, there, in other in other parts of Lewis, yeah, you have you have shielings which uh, look more like black houses. Why why would that be? I mean, are they are they, um, the the ones that are DIYed? Are they in better land, which maybe would have and bigger have families in them? Yeah, I don't I don't know. It's a I think it is a, it's a matter of speculation. I'd say one. One point, I think, is that stone is more readily available in places like Park, uh -huh. other parts of southern Lewis and northern Harris, whereas in Tolster and uh, Ness, you know, there's less stone readily available. So that, that's one possibility, but um, I don't know. It's really... It's a lot, as you will have gathered, there's a whole lot of... Uh, 
research and things to be investigated. Sorry, just to continue a bit, but if they, they didn't use stone and they presumably didn't use any other material, but, but presumably that would then just disappear yeah. with time. Yep. And you would have no trace. So you, you would only have what a stone foundation just showing that it was square or rectangular mm. or anything mm. other than yeah. circular. Yeah, well, it, it, yes, one would think that. I mean, turf, turf was, would certainly have been used, and certainly for the roofing. And, <clears throat> and I think in other areas, maybe the whole structure was built of that. But, you know, I, <clears throat> I suppose I'm going a lot by what's shown as RE, or these other yeah. words on the Ordnance Survey map from the 1850s. And um, it's not that there weren't any shearings shown in Ness. Or, you know, the density of shearings seems pretty uh, similar in Ness and down here, where the amount of rock changed a lot. So um, they, the Ordnance Survey was still recording shearings, even if they were built of less durable material. The, the other thing I should have mentioned, actually, about the Ordnance Survey maps it is, it is possible that the first ordnance surveyors, who didn't come from the islands, they saw structures out on the moor with no roofs on, so they immediately classified them as ruins. And that, that doesn't necessarily mean that they weren't still in use, because it was fairly normal to for the men to go out at the beginning of each season to re-roof the shealings. So, you know, one has to take what the Ordnance Survey said, a bit like place names, with a bit of a pinch of, pinch of salt. Yes, well, almost all the ones that I've identified were on the 1854 map. Actually, the one that isn't is the Malaska one, which is you know, one of the most impressive sets of shealings. That is not actually marked on the 1854 map. However, the, the place name near there is called um, Le Leat Nankarnikum the ledge of the, or the slope of the cairns. But it doesn't actually show sh ruins or any buildings as such. But I, th I think they, they must have missed those. Right. Um, and we, if you're all coming to the Sheelings, there's plenty of time out there to discuss all these things.